control. Yeah. If I'm a user of the software, I don't want to have to trust the developers of the project. Right? This is again a fundamental difference between proprietary and free software. If you're the user of a piece of free software, you have to uh, of proprietary software, you have to trust the maker of the proprietary software that they will produce bug fixes, new versions at appropriate times. Um, that the direction of the product is one that you that you want to see the product go in. If you're the user of a piece of free software, there's less of a requirement for trust uh, because you have you know you have the ability, you have the the right to take the software and modify it and form your own project if you don't like the direction it goes in. You don't have to trust the project leader, right? So if the project goes off in the wrong direction, the project leader goes mad and does something stupid, or at least in your opinion does something stupid, you don't have to trust them. You know that you have the choice to do something different in the future. It also means that if you are a contributor to that project, right? If you contribute to some free software project, and that free software project goes down a bad path that you don't like, you have the right to take the project in a different direction, to, to fork it and create your own project. So why, given that forking is so important, why is there a strong reluctance to fork? Because forking is almost taboo, right? But the right to fork is like a defining thing of free software, right? one of the defining attributes, but it's almost taboo, it's not quite taboo, but it is, there's a strong reluctance to actually fork. Split the developer community. Yep. Just in general, the development wouldn't happen if everyone was working on their own individual branch. Right, it splits the developer community. Okay, so it's, it means that you have less resources to work together, you're doing less sharing, you're doing less um, uh, collaboration developing the software, so the software overall will develop more slowly. Right, that's the theory, that's why you don't want too many forks. And it divides right. and confuses the user community as well. Right, so yep, don't indeed. Know which, which, which one should I be paying attention to? Exactly, and you often see big um, sort of squabbles among the user community when a fork does happen, because forks do happen, they're just relatively rare. Um, I mean, it, every year there's, there's you know, two or three projects fork, but given there's hundreds of thousands of projects, that's really not a lot. Um, can I just mention one that's yeah. relevant in setting up this next machine coming across uh, um, Ice Weasel? Right, uh, yes. Firefox. That's a very interesting one. It's not, it's not a full fork. And in fact, Ice Weasel is one of the examples that I go through in the later lectures, and exactly, um, because it's not, it's not a full fork, it's a trademark issue. The, might as well cover it a little bit now, the Mozilla Corporation, they, do you know where that came from? Do you know where Firefox and Mozilla came from originally? Um, well, I know Firefox is based on Mozilla, but I don't know. Mozilla well, was based on Netscape. Like that's right. The Netscape company was a proprietary browser, and they did the remarkable thing of releasing their browser for free as in beer, but they didn't originally release the source code. And that was considered a radical thing to do, and everyone thought they were doomed. And in fact, they did extremely well out of it. Right? And that was then emulated by a whole lot of other projects. Right? Then they did a second remarkable thing. They decided we're going to release our complete source code as open source, as free software. Right? And that was an internal push that um, Mozilla decided to do. The release, the Mozilla company, Mozilla organization decided, well, they can actually create a Mozilla organization out of this. But Netscape company decided to release all their source code, and that then formed the basis for the Mozilla Firefox series of browsers. Okay. But their corporate history led them to some interesting decisions regarding their branding. They had, their business relied strongly upon their, their brand, right, the Mozilla brand. And they decided to build into their license some strong branding requirements. And there were some small pieces of the browser. If we go and have a look at Mozilla Firefox, when we are loading a web page, it has certain artwork. Originally, it had a little lizard in the corner that sort of pulsed. Remember the pulsing lizard in Netscape? Remember using early version of Netscape? Some people are nodding, right? the older ones, <laughs> like me. <laughs> um, so there's a whole lot of art, there's a little bit of artwork. When you first bring up the Firefox browser, you can sort of bring up a little Firefox logo. Um, they decided to make those pieces of artwork. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't include those pieces of artwork and call the Firefox, uh, call the browser Firefox if you had modified any of those or if you had made certain changes, right, now um, to the browser. And they had a, a set of guidelines as to what types of changes you were allowed to make and still call it Firefox. Now what happened was um, that, hit, that hit two problems in the free software community. One was that the free software community, the free software 
guidelines, in particular the Debian free software guidelines, which the OSD is based upon but not identical to, um, require the ability to be able to change anything, the right to fork, if you like. Right? And uh, the second problem was that they actually had some changes they wanted to make which eventually Mozilla Corporation decided were outside of their guidelines what they were allowed to make. And so they had a long discussion between the Debian community and the, or the Debian legal officers and the Mozilla Corporation as to how they would resolve this. They decided to resolve it by rebranding the Debian version um, as iSqueeze. In fact, it went through several possible names. There's sort of IceFox and there's various other, other variants on this. Um, and so the solution was to create a, a rebranded browser that allowed these modifications and would not impinge upon the good name of Mozilla, which is what they were trying to protect. It was a, like a trademark protection. Now that was eventually resolved. You'll notice that I'm running Ubuntu and I am running Firefox. And the way it was resolved was um, just a few months ago, Mozilla and Debian got back together and realized this is silly. You know, 99% of the program is free software. This is these little bits of stuff you're not allowed to modify, the little bits of artwork. What we'll do is we will, um, we, they wanted to make sure that everyone understood that the program was modified and that it was uh, also, uh, that you had certain rights in using the software. So what they decided to do is when you first start the browser from a fresh install, it, it actually opens with a web page that explains your rights and obligations and explains all of these license conditions that Mozilla cared about, right? And they were not quite the same license conditions they originally had. They modified them to make you know, the solution possible. And so that then allowed Ubuntu to now come with Firefox. Now, I think some of the distributions are still going down the ice weasel route, but it's still, it's not a fork in the sense that all of the actual source code for the browser itself is in common and they share patches with each other, they share contributions, all the plugins work together. So it's not a fork, it's a, it's a rebranding uh, and it only really replaces those small pieces of artwork. But it is a, it's an interesting case in FOSS history and it's one of the ones that I, I wanted to highlight in the later lecture is it, it sort of, uh, in, uh, it really highlighted some of the issues you hit between the corporate need to brand a product uh, and the, uh, the needs of the free software community, the right to fork and the ability to modify a product. Okay, so, um, right, so the right to fork is, is very important, but I like this to fork because of the divide in the community. The, the communities tend to have a very strong technical focus. Um, if you start talking philosophy too much in most free software projects, they'll tell you to go away. So much of the material in this course, if you discussed it on their list, they'll tell you to go away. Right? They just know that stuff. They accept that stuff. It's just background, but it's not stuff that needs to be belaboured all the time. Right? Uh, there are other groups that focus just on the philosophy and on the ethical side, and those groups encourage those types of discussions. But the core FOSS projects tend to have a strong technical focus. If you're not talking about something that's going to improve the project in some way, go away. Right? Uh, openness and communication um, tend to have all their discussions, projects tend to have nearly all their discussions out in the open. There are some exceptions, uh, but nearly always discussions happen in a very open fashion. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about the first lab. Um, so you're going to wander into the lab uh, directly after this. Um, in fact, have we got morning tea first, just before the lab? Yeah, so we've got a little break and I'll get my voice back. So in this first lab, we are going to work with a very, uh, uh, quite a venerable piece of free software called HPS stands anything to PostScript. And it's been around for a very long time. Uh, it's a part of pretty much every Linux distribution. And the HPS program, I chose it, well, partly because it's the first one in the list in Synaptic that was installed on my system. Um, and I also chose it because it has, it is not trivial to download and install in all the various ways you might like to do it. In particular, um, in this lab, you'll have the opportunity to either install it using the package manager of the systems in the lab or using the tarball, the release tarball, the tarball is dot, dot tar dot gz, so like a package version of the code, um, or directly from the source code management system. And um, the, that is in order of sort of difficulties. So the first one is easiest, the, the last installing it from the source code management system, there are some difficulties with that. 
It also highlights some of the problems you'll commonly hit with dependencies. Um, and it's a project that's had an interesting history regarding change of stewardship. Plus, the website is not up to date. Uh, the directions on how to compile it are not up to date. Uh, it's not a perfect project. And I wanted you all to hit this type of project that has some interesting difficulties associated with it. It's not a poster child for how free software should be done. Um, just because I want you all to hit those difficulties together and we'll put up uh, one of your screens on the display and we'll show some of the problems you might hit. So that hopefully when you're dealing with your own projects you'll run across some of these common problems and know how to solve them. So while you're looking at the project, um, have a careful look at the website for the project. There's more than one website. See if you can work out what the official one is. Then go back and check, is it really the official one or is this another one the official one? It's hard to tell, right, with AWS. Um, who wrote it and who supports it? That's again quite an interesting question with AWS, right? How, and, and how recently has it been developed? You know, when were the last changes? How do the docs differ from a proprietary application? Have a look at the documentation and then think about would a proprietary application have documentation in that style? How would it differ? Okay. How do you submit a bug report? How do you get help? How do you ask for help and how do you use it? How many people use it? Now there's various interesting ways of answering that. Right? See if you can find some of the mechanisms for finding out how popular a project is, or at least how relatively popular it is. How active is the development? How recently have people done commits, as I mentioned? Um, make sure you have a look at the lab work documents. You've got the basic lab setup document there. There's also other documents on the website, the, the uh, course website. In particular, the lab setup, which is the one we've handed out there, right, is, uh, is also up on the website. Plus, there's in the lab work page here, there is a whole lot of information on uh, working with the projects. And there also are things like the build tips page, like here that gives you tips on how to build projects. You'll find that very useful in learning how to build a project. And in particular, it explains the three different approaches that we'll be using to build projects. Right? If you've got the time, try and approach it all three different ways and compare and contrast them. If you've got more experience in free software, you'll probably be able to get through all three in this lab. If you've got less experience in free software, you may not be able to get through it in that time. Um, so it goes through the various different ways that you can build a piece of free software. And there's also a page on um, uh, the, if you have to go back and have lab work, there's some pages on SCM tips, how to use various source code management systems. Uh, so there's this page here, SCM tips, that basically goes through the common commands you would need to use various types of source code management systems, right? Um, just working out which source code management system HBS uses can be a bit of a challenge, uh, because there's more than one. And you've got to work out which one is the right one. Right? The project doesn't tell you. Uh, so, a bit of a challenge. Okay, so thank you very much for, for listening on the first lecture. And um, all the lectures are, as, as a day's lectures have become available, they're up on the website there. So if you want to have a look through any of the slides from the lecture this morning, then it's up there. And the next two are up there as well. Uh, we've now got morning tea. Well, can I say a few words about the oh, yeah. lab setup? <coughs> so, has everyone got a copy of the uh, handout about the lab setup? Anyone? Haven't got one yet. So just very quickly, <coughs> um, we're going to be using the new combined M115, 116 double lab just on the corridor here, which was specifically set up for this course. Um, so how about that? Um, there are 40 machines in there. I think there's about 22 of us if we're all here. I don't think we're all here at the moment. Um, so there's a machine each, and we recommend that you pick a machine and then just stick with that one for the week. It'll save a lot of money around, but there's no need if you do need to change machines or if you make a mistake and decide you're sitting someone else or whatever, um, that, can, that can happen. But, but the idea is mainly that you will pick a machine and, and stick with that machine for the week. Um, we've, we were going to originally let you choose which distribution, whether you're going to run Linux or BSD or something else, and which distribution, all that sort of stuff. But uh, when we sort of worked out how long it would take to do all the installations and all the downloads and everything else, we decided that, that was going to burn up too much time. So we've actually pre-installed um, Ubuntu Intrepid, uh, which is the distribution of a, a, a Linux distribution which came out in um, October last year. The next Ubuntu distribution is due to come out this week, I think. So it'd be great to use it, but it's just not not quite ready yet for it. So we're, we're using the one that's now six months old. Um, 
and we've pre-installed that so there's instructions there on how to, to get in there. When you go in you'll need to log in with your normal AMU Uni ID and password. Hopefully you all know that. Does everyone does anyone not know their Uni ID and password? Okay, we can come speak to me and I'll I help sort out if, you, if, you, if you're in that situation. Otherwise, um, the, the machines are all booted in the standard lab thing at the moment. So you need to log in there, um, click on an icon, put in some passwords and that will install, that will update or refresh the, uh, the Ubuntu Intrepid distribution of software for you. And uh, then you can go and do that. Now we've also set up a lab server which is called doobie.anu.edu. Um, you can access that from anywhere, so go home if you, if you actually don't feel totally exhausted when you get home this evening, you can you know, SSH in or whatever you want to do. We've, um, when you get into your Ubuntu Intrepid um, environment, you will automatically get a clean internet Connection. There's there's no filters or anything we'll put there, so uh, it's it's 100 megabits from your box all the way out to um, the core routers on the internet. So you can do some pretty significant downloading if you need to. Um, also, you'll have root access. You'll have root access both in the standard lab environment. So using using sudo, you'll be able to sudo and, and do whatever you want to the normal lab machine. But also, you will have root access on your on your box, um, and obviously. You know, possibly that could lead to some interesting things if you decide you want to get, you know, a bit adventurous. Let's just say, please don't. Uh, we did learn about freedom of software. If you want to play a prank on someone, just make sure that it's going to affect their work or anything. Probably better not do it um, if you wouldn't mind. So apart from that, um, yeah, I think we've set up a pretty good environment for you to use. And uh, if anyone does want to use a different distribution because they're bored. Um, there are always some spare machines. You can hop onto another machine. You can actually mount with the normal lab environment. You can actually mount the encrypted file system we've set up, and you can install something else on there if you want. Um, you know, download BSD, install that, or you know, if you've got some spare time, you just want to play around. You're welcome to do that. No problem at all with doing that. Just make sure you don't interfere with anyone else's work while they're in there during the week. Now, when the week's over, or in fact in two weeks' time. The um, undergraduates will be back again, and in particular, those labs will be used by first years. In fact, I'll be tutoring on the Tuesday morning after Anzac Day at nine o'clock, so my class will be the first one back in that lab. Um, they're going to want to use the, the machines with the standard lab environment. Um, you are able to continue using the lab for the, the four or five weeks, or in fact, the rest of the, rest of the semester, um, to continue working on your project and to submit the, um, the final <coughs> assessment. Um, if the machine that you've been using during the uh, during this week period becomes unavailable for some reason, someone else is using it when you go and do some stuff, you can restore your image onto one of the other machines. Okay, so you can just go to any machine and restore it. It will take longer. It's better if you use the machine that you're currently using, but um, if it's unavailable, you can use another machine. Now, the students, normal undergraduate students, will not be able to affect what's on the encrypted file system other than deleting it. They can possibly. They shouldn't even be able to do that because they don't have root access. Um, the worst that can happen is they'll delete your partition. They won't be able to actually change anything in your partition. So um, hopefully, whatever you leave in the partition, and, and please back it up as, as often as you can um, uh, in case there's a problem with the hard drive or something else bad happens, um, do back it up regularly. But um, after the course is, the intensive part of the course is complete, you'll be able to go back in the lab and continue working with your. Um, your lab set up machine. Is it possible to use N111 instead of the other one? As, because that <coughs> is a generally master slide. Yeah. Um, the problem with N111 is that it's got a completely different sort of machine in there. Um, I'll have to look into whether or not we can actually run the, run the environment we've set up like the encrypted file system um, on those machines. I think they've got much smaller hard drives. They're quite old, quite old older. Um, you know, the problem will be getting the, uh, the router we've set up for this course wrapped. That's that way as well. But I'll look at that this week. And I'll take it on board too. Because um, yes, other ones always seem to be completely busy compared to that one. Yeah, there are, there are, when there are labs in there, yes. Yeah, we'll fix that up. We'll try and fix it up this week anyway. But um, in, in the, the weekend, we'll definitely make it.
it, it'll definitely be open on the Saturdays when Andrew and I will be in here providing assistance um, during the week. We'll sort out of getting you guys out as access. And then, thanks for pointing that out because I haven't actually um, connected with that. Um, and of course, you can um, download what's on Doobie to your home system and do stuff at home as well if you if you set up to do that at home. You don't need to, but if you wanted to do that, that's possible too. Anyway, I think I've. Is there any other questions about the lab setup? Um, this lab, so the lab mailing list, is, is that using our normal email and we yeah, just everything. like the list or something? Or what the the lab like? mailing list is explained um, when you go through the first lab. Today you're going to be doing lab one and you look at the website, uh, lab work, and there's lab one building HPS. It explains about joining the mailing list and it gives you a link to how to join it and it says what ID you should use. And we've set up on the once you bring up the lab environment, you'll be they're dual boot, so they can boot either into an old hardy Caleb Ubuntu distribution or into what we're going to be using, which is the Intrepid Ubuntu with a full install and unfettered internet access. Once you boot it into the lab, FOSTE lab environment, you'll find there's a little mail icon in the top bar, right, a little uh, envelope. When you click on that, it should already be set up with your account for the ANU mail system, you should be able to just put in your password and you'll be able to access your ANU email using the IMAP server, etc. Uh, and then you can join the mailing list. The reason we've got a mailing list is you're going to be participating in some um, lab work where you send patches to each other, just as you would with a free software project. And we've tried to make this environment as close to what a free, real free software project would use. And they tend to use a mailman mailing list and they tend to use tend to include patches in a particular way. We wanted you to get a feel for that before you go and do it with real projects. Um, so that's why I've got mailing list and didn't just use the discussion forums, for example. Okay. 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 I've got to go and grab the, uh, the juicy <coughs> coffee stuff, but um, we'll have it out in the, um, the student foyer in, the, in a few minutes. Okay. So you should make sure you read through this. Um, and in particular, notice that it tells you to remember